Kapla World, it's Birdo Prey 5. Welcome to my walkthrough and review of the Star Trek Picard Countdown comic number two. This is the second of three comics that are considered canon and give us essential details prior to the start of the Star Trek Picard series premiering in January 2020. If you haven't seen my video for Picard Countdown number one, please watch it first. The link will be in the top right of the video and the description. Not only will it give you the details of the first comic, it will also give you background info on the comic series and Star Trek Picard. I do have one correction from my first video. In the first scene of Countdown number one, we see two Romulans, and I mistakenly thought they were brothers. Upon closer look, they were male and female, and we'll find out more about them in this issue. Book one ended with Admiral Picard and his first officer being taken prisoner by Romulans on New Yacht Beta, a small colony on the outskirts of Romulan space. After Picard discovers that the colony actually enslaves millions of aliens who were native to the planet, and worse, they had no intent on evacuating the natives, which the Romulans refer to as primitives. Picard's ship, the USS Verity, is in orbit waiting to hear back from the Admiral. Book 2 begins with the same two Romulans, male and female, who were at the start of Book 1. This time they are in a small home near the space vineyard on New Yacht Beta Colony. One asks the other if they are ready to risk everything for a human. The guy says it's going to be the end of their life as they know it. The woman says, but it will be the start of a new one, and also throws in that they can't keep hiding. The next page changes to Picard being poured a glass of Romulan wine with the governor. Picard is apparently refusing to eat or drink anything, even though he had no problem taking food from aliens holding him captive in the third season of the Next Generation episode, Allegiance. Anyway, the Romulan governor tells Picard the situation he finds himself in was his own fault. Picard asks where his first officer, Commander Musiker, is. The governor says she's confined, but okay, and that she isn't at the dinner because this is a meal for leaders, not for underlings. Picard takes some offense and says he wouldn't describe Musiker as an underling, and then advises the Romulans to release them, as time is not on the Romulan's side. The governor seizes on Picard's words and says you're right, meaning it's the Romulans he needs to be helping and to stop worrying about the millions of native primitives on the planet, which caused the issue to begin with. She also says the primitives would think nothing of sacrificing their Romulan saviors to save themselves. Picard immediately shoots back, saviors, and tells the governor Romulans enslave these people, and he isn't going to abandon them to antiquated racism. The governor tells Picard to watch his words, or she might cut her hospitality short. Picard says he doesn't want her hospitality and demands to be taken back to his cell, adding that this will be over when Starfleet sends reinforcements. The governor explains that is more or less the plan. Starfleet will likely give anything they want to get Picard back, so in the end, the governor will get what she wants anyway. Picard again tries to warn her about time not being on the Romulan side when there's a big explosion. It doesn't appear anyone has been killed, but a Romulan runs into the room warning the governor the colony is under attack. The governor orders Picard to be taken back to his cell and for the guards to be doubled. On the way to his cell, a Romulan guard tells Picard it was foolish for his people to attack, as they clearly think it is Picard's ship in orbit. As Picard denies it being his people, there is yet another explosion. We find out the real perpetrators of the attack are indeed the natives of the planet, although they are carrying Romulan disruptors, same as the Romulan guards. Picard can't understand the natives' language, but they do call Picard by name. He recognizes one as the one who worked in the vineyard in book number one. The aliens have damn near perfect aim as they manage to hold off at least two groups of Romulans. They try to get Picard to come with them, but he refuses, and even though they can't understand each other, Picard takes a rifle from an alien and goes to find his first officer before he'll leave. Picard, who is now leading the natives, takes out the Romulan guards with their own disruptors and rescues Musiker, who says, Whoa! and then exclaims, JL! when she sees Picard has freed her. Picard is happy to see she isn't hurt and says, Thank God. He hands her a disruptor and tells her she'll need this. 
When she asks what is happening, Picard simply says, The stalemate is over. Now they finally start to head out of the compound when Musiker asks Picard if they're really going to shoot the Romulans they came here to save, to which Picard says keep the weapons on stun and only shoot for self-defense, as they blast some more Romulans. They make it outside and Picard agrees to keep moving forward with the natives since they can't contact the ship, and without the ship they have no real options. Picard is taken aback as they pass the same vineyard they had seen earlier in the day, and it's completely in flames. This confirms that the comic begins just a few hours after the first ended. As the group arrives to a cave, a native again says something to Picard he can't understand. Then the Romulan from the beginning of the comic, the guy who was with the woman in the house on the vineyard, who we saw ran the vineyard in the last book, comes out of the cave and tells Picard the native was saying Picard is permitted. Picard recognizes the Romulan and is especially confused since the natives just burned down this guy's vineyard. We finally get this Romulan's name. It's Saban. And he promises to explain it all to Picard in due time. In the meantime, he says the natives were permitting Picard and Musiker to see a very sacred place, a place few non-Uyadis ever get to see. On the next page, I really wasn't sure what I was looking at. Zaban does confirm the natives are in fact not primitives at all. Picard and Musiker are in awe at this sight in front of them. We find out we are indeed looking at an upside-down waterfall, to which Commander Rafi Musiker asks, Why not? To which I, for the first time, have to agree with her. Why not upside down waterfalls? The female Romulan comes out and says the laws of physics don't necessarily apply on this planet. She introduces herself as Laris and tells them that Zaban is her partner and they were two of the first colonists on the planet. To which Musiker cuts her off and says colonizers you mean. I have to shake my head. These people presumably just behind the rescue, and Musiker's going to go over and argue nonsense over words. Laris tells Musiker she forgets human history, and asks what does the Federation call people who settle their new worlds. Picard finally steps in to break up what he calls a fascinating discussion, but reminds people they have more urgent problems. Picard asks Saban if he planned the attack with the natives. Saban says not really. He simply didn't stand in their way. At this point, Musiker again chimes in, and I wish someone would use the stun setting on her. She exclaims that the Romulans signed their own death warrants, and reminds us that she knows how Romulan society works. You don't have to say you know about Romulan society in front of two Romulans and Admiral Picard. She goes on to say that these two Romulans will never be safe among their own people again. Zaban points out that in fact they have never really been among Romulan people to begin with, and Laris confesses that they are in fact agents of the Tal Shi'ar. On the next page turn we get a welcome break from Musiker, and we see the USS Verity in orbit. The lieutenant in command is told the Romulans are hailing the ship. He knows it is weird that they are calling before Picard, and has them put on the main view screen. It's the Romulan governor who says they are in desperate need of help. The lieutenant who identifies himself as Lieutenant Newton asks about the status of Picard and Musiker. The governor, looking sad, apologizes and said that they're both dead. The governor says the natives attacked and begs the Verity to evacuate the survivors. Newton orders a priority message to be sent to Starfleet advising them of the situation. He then tells the governor he'll need to scan the planet and send down people to which the governor easily agrees, and thanks the gods for his help. Back on the planet, the Romulan governor asks her aid how her performance went, and like any good yes man, he says it was perfect. Just in case any of us really thought the Romulans were actually begging for help, they're not. It's just a ruse. A guard informs the governor that the remaining hostiles have been eliminated, and they are walking past piles and piles of dead natives. The Romulan aide wonders out loud if Picard and Musiker are still alive. The governor says they could be, but she believed that if they survived the attack, the natives would probably kill them anyway, and in either case, she assures the aide, it will be too late for anyone to spoil their plans, and they'll be departing the planet and getting a new hostage. Now we return to Starfleet's Romulan specialist, Rafi Musiker, Admiral Picard, and the two Romulans claiming to be from the Tal Shiar. 
Musiker says straight out she doesn't believe Zaban and Laris could possibly be Tal Shiar because, as she says, Tal Shiar agents would never announce themselves as such. Never, ever. And she is the Romulan expert. We are being hailed. On screen. I am Major Rakal of the Tal Shiar. Musica tries to come up with a second reason, but can't, and claims her first reason is good enough. Tal Shiar agents don't announce themselves. I am Major Rakal of the Tal Shiar. And Admiral Picard agrees with her. I am Major Rakal of the Tal Shiar. I'm Jean-Luc Picard of the Enterprise. Admiral Picard asks, what would the Tal Shiar be doing on such a small colony world pretending to be winemakers? Tal Shiar agents, which he actually calls Tal Shiar assassins, are generally found among the elites. The Romulans agree and say that is why their cover is so good. They'd never be suspected. And the Tal Shiar watches all Romulan worlds and colonies, not just the big ones. They also say the governor doesn't even know their true identities. But this is again a break from the Next Generation canon, where members of the Tal Shiar were well known to Romulans working in the fleet and the government. Finally, the Romulans admit they are only telling this to Picard so he will trust them. Zaban explains the governor's plans to evacuate is a pretext to more, and that many in the Romulan Empire think Starfleet is actually here to sabotage the evacuation of Romulus and not to help it. Laris says Picard was brought to the planet so that both he and his ship could be taken under Romulan control. Picard is still not fully convinced. Zaban looks at Musiker and says she was right about the death warrant. They broke a rule, but not the rule she thinks. Zaban and Laris hold hands, and Zaban tells the story that they fell in love after working together for years on the planet. This was their first assignment for the both of them. Laris says if their superiors ever find out, it wouldn't be good. Musica says that was romantic and asks if after they fell in love, is that when they decided to overthrow the governor? The Romulans say no. Their mission was simply to watch, not to interfere. But when they learned of the plan to let millions of natives die, they could not let that happen and knew they had to free Picard. Picard thanks them but reminds them there isn't much he can do at the moment. It will be a very short revolution if he can't get back to the Verity. Back on the Verity, the governor, her aide, and a guard beam on board. Lieutenant Newton meets and greets them and assures the governor that they'll begin beaming up the wounded to sickbay right away. The governor gives her condolences on the loss of Admiral Picard and Commander Musiker, but Newton says that they haven't given up hope on finding them alive. The governor says she must send a message to the Senate and Newton escorts her to the ready room. Newton says he needs to remain in the room while she contacts the Senate, and the governor instructs her aide to enter security code needed to contact the Senate. As he enters the code, the ship's computer says command override, and then goes to a red alert. Newton is confused and tries to leave the ready room, but the door is locked and not responding to his commands. The aide tells the governor that the protocol worked as expected. The governor says, and I quote, We'll have to thank our benefactors if we ever get to meet. Lieutenant Newton asks, what have they done? The governor tells him to relax. He was used to the way the Federation worked, and the Federation thought they could undermine the Romulan Empire. But now Newton and his kind will have to accept the one true path, or fail as surely as Admiral Picard did. The book ends with, to be concluded. We also get a bonus photograph of Patrick Stewart as Jean-Luc Picard, from the set of the upcoming Star Trek Picard show. The third and final Countdown comic is still slated as coming out January 29th, which is the week after Star Trek Picard is scheduled to air for the first time. The next Star Trek Picard related release is the final short track of the season, being released on January 9th, 2020, which is supposed to tie into Picard directly. However, the trailer didn't seem to confirm any of that. Either way, I will be reviewing the short track. As for the review of this comic, I have to say I'm disappointed. There were no characters we knew beyond Picard, no member berries, no mention of the Enterprise or who was in command, and worse, the writers clearly seemed to either not know or not care about the finer points of Star Trek canon, 
As much of what happens in this comic does not seem to fit in the universe we last saw in Star Trek Nemesis and Voyager Endgame. The first time it became apparent was when Picard thanks God that nothing happened to his first officer in the Romulan prison cell. Picard, the most atheist of all Trek captains, sounds out of place thanking God for anything. It's minor, but it stuck out at me. And yes, I know Picard did say the phrase, thank God, one time in all seven seasons, one time in 178 episodes and four movies, there was one time in the very first season before his character traits were fully set in place. It would have been out of place, though, in season seven, and it would have been out of place in Nemesis, and it's out of place now. Also out of place was Picard assuming the Romulan weapons had a stun setting. Very convenient. At least at the time of this writing, Memory Alpha confirms Romulan disruptors don't have stun settings, and it really doesn't make any sense they would. It's not a Romulan priority to stun someone you're shooting at. In the last book, we got the explanation that Rafi Musica is the foremost Federation expert on Romulans, so I have to assume they are changing canon to say the Tal Shiar don't announce themselves as such. We've seen in both TNG and DS9 that they almost always do. It's almost as if they're giving the attributes Section 31 used to have to the Tal Shiar, and they made Section 31 in Discovery more like the Tal Shiar in TNG. And speaking of Section 31, I wonder if they are the benefactors the Romulan governor was talking about, as presumably the people who supplied the command codes for the Verity. I have long thought now that Star Trek Picard would feature Section 31, and that indeed Section 31 was somehow responsible for the destruction of Romulus, or at least making it worse than it had to be. If they are helping Romulans to take over ships to inflame tensions with the Federation, it may well make sense. And if Picard finds out about the existence of Section 31, I think that could well be the big event that causes Picard to lose faith in Starfleet. Overall, this was a weak story in my opinion. Although I remain optimistic about Star Trek Picard, I am annoyed we won't get to see a resolution to this comic before the series begins, at least not if they keep the current release schedule. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to comment, like, subscribe, and share. Sharing is really the most important thing you can do right now. Kapla all, and take care.